This video is one that has been highly requested by several people, and it kind of continues the trend of talking about the CBGB bands that I love learning more about, so really excited to bring you the story of the Talking Heads. I'm always interested in hearing what kind of bands you guys want me to talk about, so I often take recommendations from viewers. Feel free to drop a comment below letting me know what band you want me to cover next. And if you like this video, consider giving it a like and maybe subscribing if you want to hear more stories from music history. In 1972, David Byrne from Scotland enrolled in the Rhode Island School of Design, where he ended up meeting Chris France and his girlfriend Tina Weymouth. David had already started playing music. Back in high school, he was a part of a band called The Revolution and part of a musical duo called Bizzotti. They mostly perform classic balladeer and crooner style songs. So by the time he met Chris and Tina, he was very eager to jump back into playing music. David was born in Dumbarton, Scotland, which is kind of a small town on the outskirts of Glasgow. His parents were interfaith. His dad was Catholic and his mom was Protestant. And if you know anything about the history of Scotland, particularly in that time, you'll know that that raised some eyebrows. So partly for that reason, and partly because his dad was struggling to find engineering work in Scotland, the family immigrated to Canada. When David was two, so he basically grew up outside of Scotland. When he was about eight or nine, the Byrne family moved again and settled outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Originally, his Scottish accent was very thick, which made it hard for him to fit in, especially for kids of that age. Anything different is a reason to exclude someone. So he started working on Americanizing his accent. He said, quote, I felt like a bit of an outsider, but then I realized the world was made up of people who were all different, but were all here. End quote. David's family loved music, and he grew up playing his phonograph all the time. He started learning how to play music, starting with a harmonica when he was five, and eventually graduating to instruments like the accordion and the guitar. Right after high school, he enrolled in the Rhode Island School of Design, before quickly switching to the Maryland Institute of Art, just to kind of study art. After a semester in Maryland, he moved back to the Rhode Island School of Design. Trying out these different art colleges really left a sour taste in David's mouth about just kind of the whole art scene in America. He said, quote, I think art school is a real racket, especially in this country. You run into a couple of good teachers and some interesting students, but for the amount of money you spend, it's not worth it." End quote. David apparently liked to push the boundaries a little bit in art school, both in terms of his art and his performances, but also just in, like, basic human decency. According to Chris, David was once a part of a group art show, but before the gallery opened, David snuck in and rearranged all the pieces so all of his art was in the front, and every other member of his group had their art in the back, which made it seem like it was just David's show. David and Chris actually met kind of by chance. They were both helping a mutual friend create music for a short film he was working on when David turned to Chris and said, you know, I can play more than just this, which was music to Chris's ears because he had been looking to form a band. So him and David got together and they started playing some music and they formed a band called The Artistics, which at least at the start, was mostly just a cover band. At school, David decided to put on a conceptual art performance where he had his head and his beard shaved on stage to piano accompaniment while someone was holding up Russian cue cards. I'm not really sure the point he was trying to get across with that, but I'm sure he had one, and I'm sure it was brilliant. But whatever his point was, his professors didn't understand it, and they asked him to leave school, so he decided to move to New York and pursue music full-time. And after they ended up finishing and graduating from the Rhode Island School of Design, Chris and Tina joined him in New York. Chris France was born Charton Christopher France in Kentucky, but he moved around quite a bit because his dad was in the army. They were stationed in Harvard for a bit before his dad was sent to Korea, so Chris ended up living with his grandparents in Indianapolis for a bit. But eventually the family kind of settled down in Pittsburgh, where Chris started going to a prep school and started playing drums. Chris said that he had kind of grown up listening to rock music like Little Richard and Buddy Holly, but when the Beatles swept America, it really galvanized him. He said, quote, With some school friends, I formed a band called The Lost Chords. We mostly just played in our parents' basements, but we had a ball and got our rocks off, end quote. When Chris met Tina at school, they were both in relationships, but Chris said he had a feeling that she was the one he was meant to be with. So he told her, when you're finished with that boyfriend, come and find me which she eventually did. Tina and Chris actually had a decent amount in common with their backgrounds. Tina's father was also in the military. He was a Navy vice admiral, so she also spent her childhood moving to different parts of the country, including a stint in D.C. where she spent some time studying art as, like, a 
preteen teenager. So it really shouldn't be a surprise that she grew up really interested in loving art and music. She actually joined an amateur music group called Mrs. Tuff's Potomac English Hannibal Ringers when she was about 12. Her mother was French, so she grew up kind of with a different appreciation for culture and the arts than a typical American kid might have. Though Tina enjoyed music, she was really serious about her painting, and that's why she went to the Rhode Island School of Design to focus in on visual art. When Chris formed the artistics with David, he asked Tina to be a part, but she refused because she was so focused on painting. But she did help him transport his drum kit around because she was the only one with a car. Things started to get a bit more serious with the artistics when David started writing songs for the band, and especially when he brought them one song in particular. One day, David sat down and played the opening of Psycho Killer to them, and Chris and Tina both said that when they first heard it, they knew it was something special. Chris said, quote, David had asked Tina to write the bridge in French because I think he thought the changing languages would connote some kind of psychotic break or something like that. I wrote a couple lines myself, more than a couple maybe, and we started playing this song, Psycho Killer, and I noticed that people liked the song very much, like right away. End quote. The artistics kind of split up whenever David left school, but when Chris and Tina graduated and moved to New York, they started living with David in a loft, and Chris and David kind of resurrected the band. The guys had a hard time finding a bassist for the group, so eventually Tina started playing bass for them after David made her audition three times. For her part, Tina wasn't quite sure that she actually wanted to join the band, but Chris ended up talking her into it. She said, quote, Chris kept saying, Tina, you're still considered a young painter when you're 40. You can only do this and tour when you're young. So you should get a bass and do this. I had to learn everything, but it was just a complete immersion, like learning a new language, end quote. When the three moved to New York and got started as a band, they had a five-year plan. And the first year, they spent a lot of time rehearsing and arguing about the name of the band. They saw the phrase Talking Heads as a descriptor for a TV format in the TV Guide, and it just stuck. But then they met Hilly Crystal, and their five-year plan really accelerated thanks to the intervention of a little place called CBGB. I have a whole video on the history of CBGB. I'll link it below, so if you want to learn more about this super iconic venue, check that out. When Talking Heads played at CBGB for the first time, opening for the Ramones, it's one of those shows that everyone will tell you they attended. But in reality, there were probably about 10 people there. It's one of those shows that sounds super iconic now because, well, it is. It's Talking Heads and the Ramones, but at the time it was just two young teenage bands trying to impress their friends. Talking Heads started their set with Psycho Killer, and even though their sound wasn't nearly as polished as it would become, people in attendance still knew that there was something special about this group. Seymour Stein of Sire Records was either at that first show or was at a different earlier one because he was there to watch the band that he just signed, the Ramones, perform. He said, quote, I was standing out there with Lenny Kay, the guitar player for the Patti Smith group, and all of a sudden I hear music playing. I felt myself just moving more and more because I was inside the door and I was riveted, end quote. Almost everyone who saw them knew that there was something great and special about them, with the exception of Johnny Ramone, who thought they were pretentious, which Johnny's not one to call anyone pretentious, but I also don't know that he was wrong. Nothing wrong with a little bit of pretension if you're brilliant. Through more and more performances at CBGB and other underground clubs like Max's Kansas City, the band started to gain quite a bit of a local following. They recorded some demos for CBS, which ended up going nowhere, and then they signed a deal with Seymour Stein and Sire Records in 1976. They released their debut single in 1977 and then completed their sound when they added keyboardist Jerry Harrison. Jerry was born in Wisconsin in 1940 and he grew up surrounded by art because his mother taught art and studied art at the Art Institute of Chicago. His father was a musician who also worked in an advertising firm. Jerry worked really hard in high school. Besides playing in several different bands, he was also in the debate club, the student council, he played on the basketball team, he was in math clubs, just anything he could do, basically he did and excelled at. So it makes sense that when he graduated, he went to Harvard. After he graduated, magna cum laude, he joined a band called The Modern Lovers with his friend Jonathan Richmond. But that band broke up in 1974 after they released their debut album. Jerry was really thrown off by that, so he did what any of us would do, and he decided to go back to Harvard to get a master's degree. He decided to study architecture this time. Through his interest in music and art, Jerry had already seen Talking Heads perform, and he was really interested in them. So, when he was still studying at Harvard, and Tina called him up and said that Talking Heads would be playing in Boston, and he should come out and see the band, he was very excited. They all kind of knew it was like the opening 
offer for him to eventually join the band. But after he saw them play, he didn't fully commit either way. But he did commit to going to New York City to jam with them. After a few of those jam sessions, he did end up joining the band and it really helped round out and fill their sound. It made them feel more complete. The band released their first album in 1977 and their first single, Psycho Killer, did end up charting. The song was released around the same time as the Son of Sam killings, so people thought it was associated with that or at least inspired by it but it was written years earlier as we already talked about but that whole environment of fear around a psycho killer probably helped that single gain some traction also in 1977 tina and chris got married for their second album in 1978 they worked with producer brian eno who was already well respected in the artsy music scene because he had worked very closely with bands like roxy music and david bowie his eccentricities really helped Talking Heads expand their sound and experiment with different ideas. That partnership continued and expanded on their third album, Fear of Music, in 1978. Critics really loved that album, and the band spent quite a bit of time touring in support of it. After those tours, the band decided to take at least a little bit of time off. They had been touring very heavily, and they just needed a break. So in January of 1980, they returned to New York City and kind of splintered off to pursue their own solo projects for a bit. David released an album in partnership with Brian Eno that was very experimental, and Tina and Chris spent some time doing some soul searching. Already, tensions were starting to mount between Tina and Chris on one side and David on the other. Tina thought that David was far too controlling and very ungrateful for their contributions to the band. All of the songs on Fear of Music were credited wholly to David Byrne, even though Chris and Tina claimed that a lot of the songs were built around their rhythm sections. After they complained, they got partial credit on three of the songs. Tina suggested leaving Talking Heads, but Chris wasn't ready for that quite yet. So instead, the couple took a trip around the Caribbean and bought a home in the Bahamas near the studio where they frequently recorded. In 1980, David came to join them in the Bahamas at that house in that studio, and they formed a new perspective on the band. Chris and Tina were fed up with the whole frontman with a backing band arrangement that the Talking Heads had been up until that point, and they wanted more control and input put into the creative process of the songwriting and the image and the outlook of the band. For his part, David was tired of the oppressive feeling that he felt when he was in New York, so they took some time in the Bahamas to just jam and have fun playing music again. Three weeks later, after he was very excited about the demo tapes that the band sent him, Brian Eno joined them in the Bahamas and they started working on a new album. They incorporated many different cultural styles into this album, and Brian said it was like, quote, looking out to the world and saying, what a fantastic place we live in. Let's celebrate it. End quote. The resulting album, Remain in Light, is still widely considered one of the best albums ever made. But during the recording of that album, Brian started to get a bit more of an ego than the band was comfortable with. He started to want to be seen basically as a member of Talking Heads, as someone who had contributed a lot to their sound and their style. Chris said, quote, There's no doubt that Brian is an excellent producer, but his head just got bigger and bigger. End quote. By 1981, David had already started to envision his career path outside of the band, and they decided to take some time off. Chris and Tina started a new side project called Tom Tom Club, which utilized a lot of elements of the new emerging hip-hop sound, as well as a lot of musicians that were centered around that studio in the Bahamas. It was less of a band and more of a loose aggregation of different musicians and artists, but they had a decent amount of success with it and even got a gold album out of it. During the recording hiatus, the band still toured with an ever-increasing amount of musicians and even released a live album. They did part ways with Brian Eno, but he he went on to produce for U2, so I think he did pretty well for himself. In 1983, they finally returned with another album called Speaking in Tongues, which was their commercial breakthrough after being massively popular with the critics for quite a while. Their single Burning Down the House was their only top 10 hit, largely based on the back of the airplay the music video received on MTV. Since all of the members of the band were very artsy and went to art school and super into visual art and painting, their music videos were really captivating and really engrossing. They, they knew how to put on a good video. So when MTV became a thing and started to promote those videos, that really helped the band find that next level of success. And based largely on that and the strength of the Speaking in Tongues album, the band became one of the largest rock bands of the 80s. They went on a massive tour for Speaking in Tongues, which was filmed and released as a concert film called Stop Making Sense. During some of those last touring days, David hired a second bassist 
which Chris felt was undercutting Tina's part in the band. And Tina always thought it was somehow tied into the sexist ideas of the day where women shouldn't be in rock bands or women couldn't perform rock music as well as men. Maybe David didn't think that directly, but something subtly in his mind was telling him that, so he hired a second bassist. I'm sure David thought it was just expanding the sound of the band, and maybe he was right. But either way, their tour in support of Speaking in Tongues ended up being the last tour that the band did. Even though they were done touring, they did still release three more albums. One of them, 1986's True Stories, was the band playing the songs from the soundtrack of the musical comedy film that David made. In 1988, they released what would become their last album, and they were still feeling the discontent of David's creative control over the group, so they took another break. During the hiatus, David and Jerry continued on with solo projects and solo albums, while Chris and Tina continued to work on the Tom Tom Club. In December of 1991, the band kind of surprised everyone by releasing a statement saying that they had disbanded, which was news to Chris. He said that the rest of the band learned that David left the band when they read about it in the LA Times. He said, quote, As far as we're concerned, the band never really broke up. David just decided to leave. End quote. Apparently, David had been telling the other members of the band for years that he wanted the band to split up, and he thought that they were ignoring him for their own commercial benefit. When he exploded at the rest of the members of the band during a meeting in 1991, they all kept their cool because they thought it was another David meltdown, and if they all stayed calm, he would eventually get over it and they could go back to normal. But... He never got over it, and they never went back to normal. In the early 90s, Jerry, Tina, and Chris continued touring together, playing Talking Heads songs as a band called Shrunken Heads, which I think is very funny. They also ended up releasing an album together. But David took legal action to stop them releasing music under the name The Heads, which he saw as an obvious attempt to capitalize on the fame of Talking Heads. They all reunited to play together for the last time so far in 2002 when they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. David was pretty quick to point out that a full reunion was unlikely due to bad blood inside the band. Tina and Chris still talk to David occasionally, though it's mostly about business-related stuff, and they haven't seen him in person since 2003. Chris and Tina still make music as Tom Tom Club, but their last album was released in 2012. They've also worked as producers for other bands, and Chris released a book called Remain in Love. Tina has worked with a number of independent female artists, and they have two sons together. Jerry released three solo albums, the last one being released in 1990. After the band broke up, he kind of stepped behind the scenes and mostly focused on being a producer. He's worked on albums by Violent Femmes, General Public, No Doubt, and Crash Test Dummies, just to name a few. He also co-founded the Internet Music Resource Platform platform called GarageBand.com. He's also been behind the scenes as part of an investment group. In 2021, he made his first public performance since the 1996 tours that he did with Chris and Tina, when he performed some shows to honor the 40th anniversary of Remain in Light. Since the breakup, David has probably been the most active out of all of them. He's continued his solo career, he's become really involved in the film and television industries, and he's released several books. He's also done some work on Broadway, and he's done some visual art shows, but maybe his hardest and most impressive work was turning around his public image. During his Talking Heads days, he was seen as kind of standoffish and almost maybe too arrogant, but since the band broke up, he's been seen as nothing but warm and charming. Chris isn't buying that. He says, quote, It's true that his public image has changed, but friends of mine assure me that he hasn't. I think he probably just decided that he could catch more bees with honey. End quote. Tina still believes that David never cared about them, or anyone, really. She said, quote, From my experience, everything with David is transactional. He will use you until he has no more use for you. And then she went on to say, He always seemed very insecure about himself and would often try to blame other people if things went wrong. Chris and I loved him dearly, and we did our best to overlook these disastrous character flaws but it seemed obvious that Talking Heads wasn't going to last. In interviews, David always says he's happy, and I'd like to believe that, but if he's happy, why does he refuse to refer to Chris and I or Jerry by name? He calls us people he used to play with, end quote. Despite all of that, Chris insists that he is not bitter or jealous about David's continued success. For his part, David believes that he is somewhere on the autism spectrum, even though he's never been diagnosed. At least, he's never publicly said that he's been diagnosed. I don't know what he's done in his private life. And I think in recent years, he's walked that back a bit and says that maybe he is not on the spectrum. Whatever it is, he called it a superpower that allows him to hyperfixate on his work. But that could also be a reason for his 
struggle connecting with people. Uh, either way, it hasn't held him back professionally at all. He said, quote, being in a band is really wonderful. You're like a family. You're like a little team, a little army. But after a while, all of the negative stuff in a family is there as well as all the positive stuff. So fans have really kind of given up on talking heads ever even being cordial with each other again until October of 2023 when all four members appeared together for, as far as I can tell, the first time since the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction on The Colbert Show. They were there promoting the re-release of the concert film Stop Making Sense. At least for that one appearance that I watched, they seemed to get along, at least respect each other a little bit. David was kind of deferring to the other members of the band to answer questions, and it's put a little bit of hope back into the Talking Heads community that maybe there is something there. Maybe there will be a little bit of a future. So I guess we'll just have to see. Anyway, that's the story of Talking Heads, a truly revolutionary band who changed a lot of rock music and left the music scene completely different than when they entered it. And there's really nothing more you can ask for as an artist. Once again, if you liked this video, if you enjoyed hearing more of the story behind Talking Heads, please give it a like, share it with a friend who you think might like it, and don't forget to drop a comment below of any bands you would like for me to cover. <laughs>